And now it's time for the man with the caffeine, the new tropics for the brain. It's Coffee with Mike. Hang in, hang tight, grab your cup, and uh, let's get this started. Hey, gang, welcome back to Java Chat. This is Coffee with Mike, and I'm sitting here with Kurt Nelson of the Behavioral Grooves podcast, which is a, a, a it's cool. Let's just <laughs> let's just start with that. It's cool, and 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 here's why. <laughs> When when I for some of you that like know and have been listening to my podcast, you guys know I like to go digging on stuff, and because I'm I'm curious about just about everything. I, this is like the first actual behavioral science person I've had here on the podcast where we can actually start looking at that as a subject. Because most times we're talking about business, entrepreneurship, mindset, you know, wealth building, all that kind of stuff. We actually get to sit here and talk to somebody that's going to help us understand why these things one matter two what is it that we're doing that either is good or not good and and how can we improve that so i i when i found when i found his profile uh and i took one look at it i went ooh, behavioral science because i've i've had people who are masters in psychology great conversations but behavioral science as the subject i've never had so thank you for joining us today I am excited to be here. This will be this will be interesting. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm so counting on it. This is this is going to be fun. G Kurt, give us some background on on who you are, where you're from, how long you've been doing this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, so I'll do the short version. I uh, I'm a behavioral scientist. I have a company. It's called the Lantern Group. We are a behavioral design and communication agency. Have had that since 1997. So it's morphed a little bit in that time, but yeah. basically we've been doing this work. Uh, with with clients since 1997, looking uh, inside organizations mostly to understand how do you motivate and engage employees is really the, our main sweet spot for that. Uh, and it's about applying behavioral science. And behavioral science, to your point, um, takes some psychology, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, there's a yeah, lot of psychology sure. within behavioral science, but Absolutely. there's also sociology. There's also yep. neuro, uh, uh, neuroimaging, all sorts of anthropology. It's anything that has to deal with why people think and mm -hmm. do what they do. So if there's any aspect of that, that's mm -hmm. where behavioral science comes in. And so my mm -hmm. background on that um, is, you know, I, I went to college, got a marketing economics degree, got a MBA after that, and then I went on and got my PhD in IO psychology, nice. uh, but have been working in this field about trying to understand why people do what they do for well over 20 years now and applying that. So who, uh, generally speaking, the clients that you work with, are you, you dealing mostly, mostly with executive level or HR or who, or a varied, it depends, or how does that work? Yeah, it, it, it depends as in most of these. Uh, the vast majority are senior director and above, mostly mm. Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 companies. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but we're doing a lot of work with, with large scale incentives. We're doing work with uh, processes in place of training uh, managers on how they can work with their employees and how they better understand why their employees are doing what they're doing. Um, and then how do you build in things in order to make sure that they're, they're engaged, that they're motivated uh, the around that. Typical situation that you've had to address using behavioral science within a, with, within an organization. We'll start with that first. Cause there's, there's a lot of this that applies to normal life as well that we'll oh, want yeah. to get into. So, yeah, well, a lot of times, so I'll, I'll use the, the, a basic one, right. Is mm -hmm. uh, a company has an incentive plan in place. They go, Hey, um, our strategy has changed and we don't necessarily know what we need to do with the incentive plan mm -hmm. in order to really make sure that we're, we're incenting uh, people to do the behaviors that we we right. want them to do that align with the strategy. Right. Uh, a lot of times incentive plans have a negative aspect because people don't take into account the fact that people are human and yeah. that we're not robots. And so you can't right. just plug and play. And so there's all these unintended consequences of an incentive Welcome plan. back to 1970s. <laughs> But that's really this aspect. So we go in and we'll work with them and say, all right, so what are you trying to achieve? And let's understand them as an emotional human being mm -hmm. and understand that, mm -hmm. wow, just offering them 
additional money isn't always going to be the best thing. Not saying that that doesn't work, um, but maybe there are other ways of doing this. Also thinking about, are you focusing in on, on collaboration or teams? Is that part of what you need them to do from their job? Uh, and if you have a, an incentive plan that's put in place that is driving, hey, you know, I got to be number one in order to really earn any money on this. Well, am I going to be collaborating with my peers that are down there? Am I going to be hiding things from them? And so, I mean, those are some simple aspects of this. But then there's also this idea of what really motivates people. And yeah, there you go. Intrinsic <clears throat> versus intrinsic, mm -hmm. extrinsic mm -hmm. motivation. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the aspects that we bring in. That's that's interesting that you say that because in my experience um, in business etiquette training, one of the things that you learn is there are different motivational aspects in the, in a person's life, and it's there's there's quite a few times where money is not the motivator. No, in fact, it could be it could be just you know some some people are more motivated by going out and serving the community. Some people are more motivated by doing research yeah. and getting getting the best research out of things. And and to have the one size fits all incentive program and thinking it's going to actually work, you're going to confuse people. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to confuse some people. How does that apply here? I mean, I, that's I was one of those guys. I'm not a, I'm not a money motivated person. You know, I'm I'm the guy that's like, how do I feel better about how I'm serving here? Yeah. You know, is 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 my client really going to get a benefit out of this? Is 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 our is our customer really going to have a, a a better product? Yeah. If not, I can't sell this. Yeah. I, I just I won't. I don't care how much money you want to throw at me. Yeah. I'm not selling it. There's there's a model that's called the four drive model. It was developed by uh, Paul Lawrence and Noria. They are both from Harvard. Um, mm -hmm. It's been around now for not quite twenty years, and it's one that we use. And and it, it talks about this idea that hey. Uh, we're motivated by uh, achieve or by by getting things right, by acquiring things right. Sure. So that's money, that's that's awards, the trips, all of those things. Yeah, that's yeah, part yeah. of it, right? Yeah. There's there's an aspect, but we're but we're also much broader than that. And so mm -hmm. we also uh, the other is a four drive. So the first one is acquire and achieve. Uh, the second drive is bond and belong. We are social creatures. We will do. This is the one I think companies miss often. Is we will do a lot. To I'll make sure I'll confirm that now. You don't even have to think, dude. It's it is it is it's overly done in a lot of cases. And I and I don't I don't know that it's necessarily intentional. I think the drive for profit is is a is part of the driving factor that creates these things that forget that part of that we're social humans. There has to be something in there. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that has to be a, an an element of that in the bonding portion. Because like you said, if there's no collaboration. You got a bunch of competitors that are doing nothing but cutting each other's throats, and it's not worth it. You you end up losing your best talent over not having the right kind of incentive that has those. And I know there's more. I, it, again, I didn't mean to no, interrupt, but, but you you bring up a really good point. It's this: Do you create a culture that is cutthroat, um, and then it's everybody out for themselves? Uh, and, and in the short term, that can work really positive. In the long term, what it does is it is it creates these, uh, you know, warring factors inside mm -hmm. of an organization. Mm -hmm. But then it also doesn't tap into this drive that we have, which is really about I like you know the the I always use this analogy, right? We have this belief in America of that lone cowboy out on the plane, and that's this idealized life and different things. And I always tell everybody, yeah, but that cowboy came back to a camp at night yeah. and sat yep. around and sang songs yep. and talked with the other cowboys in that camp. And that that's was right. needed. They couldn't be out there on their own. It's actually really not good. And yep. when we create an organization uh, that doesn't allow those conversations, and it's been really hard, I think, for a lot of corporations with, with COVID and, the, and you know, the coronavirus and working from home, how are you, how are they embracing this and trying to keep some of that bonding some of that sense of belongingness that is inherent when people get together in in these trying times so so I, and i i had a i had a visual as you described as you were talking through this when you have a company it's it's like having a continent and creating incentivized programs that are only singularly driven and creating that kind of a you know overly competitive atmosphere you literally give them the tools to create an island yeah and when humans become islands, they become very disjointed and disconnected and, and psychologically, they're just not 
able to connect anymore. Would you rather have a bunch of islands where you have to travel hours to get to the next one? Or would you rather have just a simple road that you can drive down and go visit your partner, yeah. visit your visit your neighbor, your 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 friend? Huge differences, you know. And and I, I think a lot of a lot is lost, um, especially like you just mentioned the whole COVID thing. Everybody was locked down at home, no choice. Everybody was an island for that whole yeah. time. And now that everybody's back out, everybody's going, where are we? What are we doing? How are we? How are we going to get back to normal? after that yeah um so how well, does behavioral he, science apply i mean it, it, when, when you're looking at it that way where does where does that come in <laughs> well behavioral science again has those aspects where we're looking at how do people why they're doing the things they do and so you can see some of the getting back in as you said things are opening up and you see these mm -hmm. people congregating mm -hmm. maybe and i and again i'm not going to comment on i'm not an epidemiologist but you know is it really safe but we've had this desire for human contact and bonding and belonging for these months that mm -hmm. it's just so necessary for us and um you know behavioral science looks and tries to understand it also brings in uh this aspect of understanding Dan Ariely is a behavioral economist who, who mm -hmm. falls into this camp, and he wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. And uh, basically, economists, which you know, I, my undergraduate is in, has this model of human behavior that is predicated on that we're rational beings, that we look mm -hmm. at, you know, we maximize what's called utility, which is basically mm -hmm. our well-being by looking mm -hmm. at all these different factors, getting as much information as we can, and making decisions. Mm -hmm. When we actually look at human behavior, that is not how we operate at all, right? We mm -hmm. are we we, right. we go off of our gut. We go off yep. of preconceived ideas. We have, yep. you know, if if it's a sunny day out, that impacts how we respond. When if it's sunny or rainy, it shouldn't matter how we buy stocks or don't buy stocks. And yet right. we've seen research that shows that. So all of those factors are what behavioral science talks to us about. And so understanding, again, as you were mentioning, how people are getting back into the workplace, back into everyday life, there are some things, Dan talked about this book as predictably irrational. So from an economic perspective, we're irrational, but we're very predictable in some of those irrational things. We, uh, there's a bias, a human bias, it's called loss aversion that's been well-documented, where we take... Uh, <laughs> The, I giggle we lost a hundred dollars. The pain of losing a hundred dollars is typically twice as much as the pleasure yep. that we get from finding a hundred dollars yep. on the street. Yep. So we do a lot more to avoid those losses, right? Um, you know, if we own something, so you, coffee, right? And yep. so they did a, a classic experiment as Richard Thaler did this experiment with coffee mugs, basically, uh, again, saying, Hey, people, how much would you pay for this coffee mug? And people said, oh, $5, something along that line. Don't, don't quote me on the numbers. Yeah. And then um, for other people, he, he gifted the, the coffee mug to them and said, so how much would you be willing to sell this for? And just because they owned it, they're going, oh, I wouldn't sell this for under $10, right? Yeah, this this exactly. is a great coffee mug. Look at yeah. the great design. Look yeah, at all well, this. Everybody becomes a wolf of Wall Street when they have something that they own. It's exactly. hilarious. And so that's the endowment of look it. at so how we have, sales. <laughs> we have we have a number of these things, yeah, right? And, we do. and so understanding those are the more that we can better understand from a work perspective how people show up, how our customers might react, but also you know in our own life how we respond to things. So, if we're looking at uh, so and you you lead right into one of the questions I wanted to ask, um, and it deals with motivation because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to to address let me let me back up a second one of the things that we're talking when we're talking about human connection and being in the presence of each other and again this is something that i talk about when i do business etiquette training okay. being present allows for human connection you have to be in each other's presence for that energy to actually connect to really feel it mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a lot of the attempts to keep that connection was mildly mitigated in my opinion you know, that and five bucks gets you Starbucks. We're mildly mitigated during COVID using this very platform that we're recording on right now. Yep. Um, I, have, I know a lot of millennials, a lot of Gen Zs. Gen Zs were using uh, Discord and, and other chat platforms like TeamSpeak and stuff like that. The millennials were using Zoom. Some of us were using Zoom to try to stay in touch with our friends and our family um, because we knew we couldn't physically see them. So again, I say mildly mitigated 
some of the issue, but that then then you get this whole thing where you start feeling down because you don't get that interaction. And now that we're out of it, it seems like there's a lingering, and, and maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but it seems like there's still a lingering lack of motivation to do anything. So how would how would you use well one how would you use behavioral science to be able to help somebody understand how they can motivate themselves to get moving again if yep. you will you mentioned sun sunshine yeah great factor for affecting mood yeah if you get your ass outside <laughs> i mean we've been locked down in the house for two months i make it an absolute point on the daily to go out and walk around in the sunlight if it's raining i go outside and i stand in the rain yeah and the, and the only reason is is because it's still part of who we are. We live on this little blue globe that gives us different elements to feel differently about different things. So how would you how would you suggest somebody can actually, you know, motivate themselves, get up, do something different or do something better? Yeah, it you bring up a really important question and it's one of these multi, you know, million dollar, the fifty thousand dollar question or whatever exactly. the game exactly. show was, right? Yep, that's it. Uh, but the idea of, of this, and you bring up a, I'll just uh, touch up on one point real quick. You talked about this human touch and, and various different pieces. There's lots of research that actually just human touch releases endorphins in our brains, which is mm -hmm. this, both it's a soothing, calming piece. And yeah, while exactly. we do Zoom and all these others, we still don't get that. Exactly. Um, so, so to that point, how do we get up and move after we've been in lockdown for months and maybe maybe we haven't been going outside, maybe we haven't been motivated to do these mm -hmm. things. And so then mm -hmm. we have habits form and mm -hmm. habits form uh, very quickly yep. when they're negative, it seems. And this is not a professional opinion. This is just me pontificating. It's so, like, wow, those bad habits form really easy, but the good habits I want to do form really hard, yeah. right? Yep. Um, yep. So we get stuck and we get stuck in these ruts about being lazy and, and not getting off the couch. And as you said, not getting out. One, one way of doing that, um, there's lots of research on goals and how to just set goals. So if you yes. can set a, a specific goal for yourself, uh, that in and itself can be a, a positive motivator. Now, you have to align that with something that you think is really important to you. And this is, this is an important thing. It's often like you think about people who set these goals who, um, uh, you know, a, a New Year's Eve resolution or whatever it would be. That's not There's a goal. Big, that's a dream. Yeah, <laughs> that's a dream. Like right? these big, big lofty pieces. And those are great, but they need the goals to be really effective. Uh, Gary Latham, who, who is one of the, the two people along with Ed Locke who talk about uh, goal setting theory. It's one yes. of the theories about goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you need to have them specific, right? But you also need them to be a little bit stretched, but not so much that you don't, don't get them. Right. And then you also have to, they, they have to tie into who you are. So there's this ideal, there's this aspect about self-identity. Mm -hmm. And this is the part I think from a self perspective, um, we tend to look at our self identity mm -hmm. um, and we have these beliefs about who and what we are. And there's an aspect, self-schema is another aspect, right. which basically says, here's how we show up in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and the words that we use to describe ourselves in that make a big difference. So if I um, uh, think of myself, and I, I use this all the time, I used to always, you know, when people said, well, tell us about you and, and yourself. And in my bio, I had, I, I, you know, I'm a canoeist, uh, you know, nice. I live in Minnesota and I, I, I go canoeing. And when I actually started to sit down and think about it, I'm going, I can do maybe once a year when I go with my family up to the Boundary Waters. <laughs> if I was really a canoeist, would I, you know, I'd be doing this a lot more. Yeah, I own a, I own a canoe, but am I, am I a canoeist? No. So <clears throat> you, you need to think about that. And so there's this element of, of who we are and what we talk about. Um, and then if, if you can set yourself up to say, this is the person that I am. So I'm a runner or I am, I'm a person who <clears throat> needs to get up and do things. I'm a doer. Uh, and, and then you frame the words around that. That can help as well. Now, none of these are silver bullets. None of them are, are these other pieces. I mean, you can, you can put in place what are called Ulysses contracts with yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> um, basically, there's lots of apps out there that you can do it if you don't have a friend, but you can just do it with a friend or a spouse or somebody and basically says, look, I want to get up and get off the couch. I want to exercise four times a week. All right. right. So a Ulysses <laughs> contract is basically saying, 
if I don't do this, there's going to be some negative consequence at the end and I'm going to hold my, you're going to hold me to it. Right. Um, so Accountability be, has to have it, some, otherwise yep, it's worthless. It might be a hundred dollar bet. It might be, uh, there's a, there's an app that I, I don't have any uh, relationship to. It's called Stick, and I believe it's with two Ks at the end, S-T-I-K-K, uh, where you go in. Basically, you say, I'm going to do X. You have an accountability <clears throat> partner who gets signed up with it, and every week or every time you set it up, you have to say, yes, this is it. But with that, you put a credit card down, and it says at the end of this, if you, if you fail at this, not only will we take money out of that credit card, but it will get donated to uh, uh, something that you disagree with. So if you are, um, <laughs> you know, if you're, again, whatever it would be, if you're, <clears throat> I know you don't get political, but if you're a Democrat, it'd be the, the national, it'd be the Republican uh, National Committee. Or, or vice versa. Republican, it's vice versa. <laughs> so whatever that would be, but it goes to wow. something that, so it's not only Talk about it a taking, fear of loss. taking money from you, but it's, it's, it's putting that money in a place that you don't like. And you can, oh, um, I'm going to go look this app up now. This sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. So those are ways that you can, you know, Build yourself commitments. As you said, accountability is key. You need to feel accountable, and we're not very good at holding ourselves accountable all the time. Even, even in accountability situations, though, aren't there behavioral biases that we have that still fight us, even in the midst of – I mean, talk, talk to me about that. I mean, there's, there's, I know that there's – because I've done that before, but, you know, accountability. I've had accountability partners and all that kind of stuff, and there have been times where I've still – and it's taken me years. I mean, it's been a, like a 15-year journey for me. I was a musician for 15 years, dude. My, my two biggest questions in life were, am I going to the beach or my friend's house to play music? That was my, that was my life for 15 years. Not kidding. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. <clears throat> yeah, well, <laughs> on, on sunny days it was. Um, but but, it, but in, when I started getting into business and, and realizing <clears throat> I didn't have the habits, I didn't have the mindset, I didn't have the motivation, and then I started getting into accountability, I was like, Shit, I've never been accountable to anything in my life other than, you know, where do I go play next? Yeah. And, and, I, and I did have other jobs. Don't get me wrong. It's probably, I was like the hardest working family in Jamaica. I had four jobs at one time in a week. Yeah. But, I mean, the accountability wasn't really there to accomplish anything. And then I come out here and I'm like, why can't I get anything done? It's better now. It's a lot better now, obviously, because we're <laughs> on a podcast and I'm, I'm doing this weekly. So, um, but how does how does that how does that affect people behavioral bias yeah it when you think about we have a really our, our brains are really tricky because our brains <laughs> that's an understatement yeah because as much as we like to think uh we understand ourselves we we don't really understand our own motivations very well um it, it's one of the biggest things that you you can ask people one of the uh one of my favorite things and I work with clients, but just in, just in general, is there's an element that's called the say-do gap. So what we say we're going to do and what we actually <laughs> do are, are there two different <clears throat> mental processes when we do it. When we're saying something, we're projecting our future self out about this is what I, I envision myself doing, all of these different things. But when we actually get in the moment, uh, there's a whole bunch of other aspects that come into play, and it's like, but isn't nope, this not... one? Isn't this just one brain? What the hell? I mean, why are we? It, it sounds like there was some kind of lobotomy or a yeah. cut in hand, and it just like there's a disconnect. What the? What's? I don't understand that. Well, that's that's some of the, these biases, right? We we have this element of our future self, which is why, again, procrastination, right? I will. <laughs> Jer Familiar. Uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld has this great thing where he talks about. Uh, tomorrow jerry versus like late night jerry versus morning jerry right oh and, boy oh, oh like, boy well, i'm just gonna stay up a little bit later you know but tomorrow jerry you know trying to get up in the morning because yep. late, late night jerry stayed yep. up late right yep. Yep. so there's that future idea of i'll do it tomorrow but today i'm gonna eat the donut you know yeah. but tomorrow i'll go on that diet right, right. um right. and there's always tomorrow and we can always push off tomorrow uh, the other piece about that, though, is from an accountability perspective, is our brain is really good at rationalizing things away. So, Golly, that's another can, statement, too. We can, you know, I, I might even have an accountability partner, but you know what? I, I know I was supposed to get up and go running today, but I, hey, I, I stayed up late last night. I'm super tired. 
Uh, Guilty. So today I'm just going to make an excuse and I, I won't do it today, right? Guilty. I mean, yeah. but so how do you overcome that? I mean, where, where do you start to, where do you start? Yeah, I know, right? The, that, there's the real $50,000 question. Where do you uh, start to begin to change that behavioral bias or how? Yeah, so um, there's a couple, and then again, none of these are silver bullets, and some of them, they're, they're, they're hard. Oh, if they were any, easy, any tip, all, any tip for any of these listeners, they'll try it, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> so one is you can make, you can have the accountability be such that you can't get out of it, and it's so painful that you are going to do it regardless. That works um, until that accountability is gone, and then we often fall back right into, you know, it, 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 we go, oh, if I only do it 10 times, if I can do it 10 times or 20 times, or, you know, those ideas of like a forming a habit takes 21 days. Research says, no, that's a bunch of hogwash. It depends on the, how easy or hard that habit is. How, how do you do it the same time every day? Do you do it? Um, yeah, I've heard, same 66, way, I've heard 66 days is the, is the absolute. And then, and then to your point about accountability, it has to be a non-negotiable. It's one of those things that you just will not let go of. Yeah. But, but then, again, figuring out the motivation behind what is that true non-negotiable? And is it really that? Yeah. I mean, is, is getting up in the morning and, and running – I'm not changing that for anything, you know, yeah. if, 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 if there's, so if there's a lack of commitment on that, you know, how do you, how do you retain? Which gets back into how do we talk to ourselves about who we are? Oh, uh, here we go. Now we're talking. All right, good. Yeah. So it gets back into, so you said it's that non-negotiable is, is, am I the person who no matter what gets up and gets out of bed and goes for, and does my workout, whatever that would rain, yep. sun, snow. Yep. You know, yep. I live up here in Minnesota. And so it's cold many yeah. days, right? Y'all, y'all get some bad cold. I've been in the airport and it's a freaking <laughs> compound. So you guys can motiv- move around in that cold. It's crazy. I mean, but, but those are the things like if, if you, I have, and, and I'm not one of these guys that gets up and runs, but I have friends that do, they, they run in the, in weather that I go, what the hell? I yeah. mean, yeah. there is like, you could, you you're risking bodily harm from frostbite going out in these weathers they're called, at five in the morning. They're right? called treadmills. You can do them <laughs> in your house, but that's and, just me. You know, exactly. just, I'm just saying. I, I, but, but what it is, is they're talking to them. They, they, <clears throat> they view themselves that this is part of who they are as a person. And so if they mm. don't, mm. if they don't do that, it is, it's not just a minor inconvenience or something that maybe I'm not going to be in better shape, but it's about who I am as an individual. And so then you are much more likely to keep that behavior. And if you don't, all of a sudden it creates this angst within you because all of a sudden your behavior yep. doesn't match with this ideal about who you are. So when you, when you run into something like that, because I, I want to address the other side of that coin, which is, if you find out you're not that person, how do you keep yourself from becoming maniacally disappointed? <laughs> Come on, I, everybody I, does. You know that people do this daily. This, oh, I could, I thought I could do it. I can't do it. I can't. I, yeah. and, and they, their self, their self vision just becomes shit. But it's so, not. It's not. It's just not who they are. How do you? Right. How do you get people to to correct that and say it's okay? Just you need to go find something else. Well. Lots of people will stay in what is self-denial, right? And yes. so they, they yes. will make they will continue to hold this belief about themselves and will yep. make again again, as I said, they will rationalize away yep. why they're not again, you know, my really bad analogy of a canoe you know, me being a canoer and, and I'm not, right? So we'll just we'll just say that you are. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in my head for years it was like, yeah, I, you know, and I would go and I would start to think about that. And and again, it's a bad analogy, but this idea <laughs> of like going, if I really was, wouldn't I be out there do I mean wouldn't that be part of what I would be you'd, doing you'd, more than you'd be paddling on the year. ice in winter just like your buddies go out running. So exactly. And, yeah, I'd be taking exactly. that out and and running the canoe down the hill and, and using that instead of skis. Um, That'd be funny. But, you know, but, but this idea that we have to, that, that we have this, um, this denial part that comes up. Yeah. But yeah. then, but then for those times where that denial, all of a sudden we break through that facade and mm. we go, holy crap, I'm, you know what, I'm not that person. Yeah. Uh, there can be this, this backlash that, wow, I really thought I was and I'm not, what am I going to do with my life? 
Um, again, it comes down to the self-talk that we have within right. ourselves. So how do we talk to ourselves? And so, okay, uh, which gets into, you know, some of, do we have a growth mindset or do we have a fixed mindset? And I know yes. you, you said you've talked about mindset sometimes. Yes. And you talk about some of Angela Duckworth and, and some yep. of those, those people that are doing some of that work. Yep. But all right, so if I'm not that, then what am I? Or what do I want to be that I can be? Mm -hmm. And can we then reframe how we view ourselves? Can we reframe this idea about who we are? And, 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 and this is the big piece is that I think people often think about this as this has to be this overarching change my entire being life thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> our self-identity is actually made up of, and I'm getting researchy here, so I apologize. No, no, it's made it. up of, of, of a multitude of what are called self-schemas. And self-schemas are how we show up in a certain context, a okay. certain environment. Okay. Makes so sense. we have multiple self-schemas about ourselves. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, yourself at work is different typically than yourself with your kids. It's different from you with your friends. Uh, is different in a board meeting versus in your right. office, Absolutely. et cetera. Absolutely. So you don't have to change your, your overarching self-identity. You have to change these ideas about who you are showing up in these certain moments. And that's a lot easier. That becomes a lot easier than trying to say, I'm not this type of person. Well, I'm not this type of person in these situations. I might be this type of person in these situations. Or you shift that a little bit and you go, I, I show up in these situations in this manner. Right. And that can help you. Uh, again, it's hard. And I, I want to just re reemphasize that. Um, and this is where, uh, again, we don't understand our own motivations very well in different yeah. things. So if you can yeah. work with somebody on this, if you can just have that accountability partner <clears throat> and be fully transparent and honest and, and setting up, like, how are we going to talk about this? How are you going to do this? How are you going to support me? And, I think a lot of people change. forget. I think a lot of people forget setting expectations is very important whenever they set up a goal or an accountability partner that, that they fail to have that conversation and they end up setting themselves up for the fall. Yeah. And then when it comes, they're not prepared for how to deal with the after effects of that fall. Um, interesting thing, the way you just explained everything, the first thing that comes to my head is an old joke. How do you eat an elephant? <laughs> I don't know how. One bite at a time. <laughs> yeah. And it's the only way that you can fix this. The overarching is it, it any large picture, any large corporation is a puzzle of smaller pieces. Um, some of the friends that I have that are consultants, one in particular that I know, um, Bob Smith, who's uh, from South Africa, he literally takes an organization, turns it upside down, pulls out all the gears, looks at all the gears, see which one's missing the cog or which cog is not big enough or too big or, you know, where's the issue? Fixes the one cog, one. Yeah. Puts the gears back together, puts it back on its feet, and all of a sudden everything's running smooth and humming. I don't think people realize it's a lot of times it's one underlying issue, maybe one thing from your, and then this starts getting into psychology further, a trauma that happened as a kid. Mm -hmm. You become a self-sabotager or you become a saboteur of sorts for yourself and for others yeah. just because of that one thing that happened. And it was never intentionally against you or it was never intentionally um, meant to hurt you, but your brain imprinted it. Right. And, and the thing is, is that, we have these underlying ideas about who we are and how we show up in these situations. And to your point, it could be from an experience when you were a child, it could be just from, hey, what happened in college, or it yeah. could be just how you yeah. started off your work life in, in certain areas. Yep. And they're, they're either, um, they were either never true or B, more likely, they're no longer true, right? right. You right. have right. shifted, <clears throat> the world has shifted, and yet we still hold these old beliefs about ourselves. Therefore, the, the thing, if you can just take a really good look, introspective look at some of those beliefs, which is hard, which is why you need that other person, somebody you trust, and you set up these ideas with them to say, well, this is how I see you showing up. I have a good friend. Um, who, you know, has failed miserably at m all these businesses and it's always somebody else's fault. Ooh. Always, always Ooh. somebody else's fault, Ooh. right? It's this, they do this, they do this. And I go, <laughs> you know, it's like, there's one constant here. This, yeah. There's one constant. It isn't, you know, and, and that's, that's you. But 
you know, he's not ready to, to be looking at himself in that, that yeah. light. And so you can't force somebody in there. But if you are ready to look at yourself, um, and there may be, this isn't saying everything is negative, right? It isn't saying that you got to look and you're that person who's always failing at things. It may be looking at saying, you know, is this the best life that I want to live? Is this the, you know, hey, I'm doing pretty good at work. I'm doing pretty good here. But maybe I want to have a better relationship with my kids and maybe I don't have time enough for them. So maybe I need mm-hmm. to be rethinking how I show up for my kids. And what does that mean for me as a parent? What does that mean for how I have to think about those times when I'm spending with my kids? All of those factors when you go into it. And, and so when we mm-hmm. talked about those accountability pieces, you know, I, I, I always look at accountability partners as you can have one or many yeah. But they act in three roles. They act as this cheerleader role, yep. which is, <clears throat> hey, you know what? Keep working at it. Great job. Those are the, that's often what we think about accountability coaches as being this, the cheerleader. And then there's this referee. They're the ones who are there that are saying, you know what? You, you, you stepped out of bounds. Now you need to get back in line and, right. and we're going to hold you accountable for right. what that is. That's the other right. piece. But the piece that I think that is missing oftentimes is this coach analogy, which is being there to help you all right, so what can you do to improve? How can you be better and help working with you to say, here are the things that you need to be practicing. Here's, here's a way of approaching this, this uh, environment, this context, this mm-hmm. situation mm-hmm. that did you think about it this way? And so, you know, one person can act in all three roles. You can have multiple people acting in, in each in different roles, but make sure that you have all three of those areas covered. And I think, I think a lot of people, like you said, the, the, the last element of coaching, um, you have to be cognizant of who you're choosing and asking to take on these roles because they may not be a coach. And it's, yeah. not, and it's not their fault. Yeah. It's just don't pick your best friend because he's your best friend. Yeah. You know, you, I, you, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so I, in, when I was writing my dissertation, um, for my PhD, I asked my wife to, to, to be this, you know, she's my best friend. She's there. She, you know, I uh, asked her to, and she said, no, she said, she was smart. I, could be, I, could be your cheer, I can be your cheerleader. She said, but I am not going to be that nagging wife that says you didn't go and write, you know, this morning, your you 30 minutes that you said you were going to write or research on this. I'm not yeah. going to be that person. I, it, that will just, mess up our relationship and in retrospect it was probably the smartest thing <laughs> one of the smartest things and why i married her right she's much yeah, smarter exactly. than i am um but yeah you have to make sure that the person that you pick is the right person it may not be your best friend yeah because they're not gonna they, you don't want to ruin that relationship it may not be your spouse it may not be um you, you know whatever pick what i've what i've learned what i've learned from that though because i have i have had accountability partners I've created some of the best friendships because they were able to fill all three of these roles. And thank you for clarifying why they are my best friends, because these are the guys that will call me after they see me do a social post or they see me, they talk to me or something like that, that will go, yo, you're full of shit at this point. Yeah. We need to talk. Yeah. And, and, and I depend on this because again, we're always trying, you know, growth or decay. I don't want to decay. So when they call and they say stuff like that, I'm just like, what? What did I do? Yeah. Like, it's, it's not what you did. It's what you said. Yeah. I said, well, what did I say? And we go through it. And I'm like, I don't understand. And they explain it to me. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about any social justice or any political conversations. It's they catch me saying something that directly reflects on my doing or not doing. And they'll call me out on it. And I'm just like shit, did I, did I actually say that? And it's like, yeah, I do it to my business partners. I'm like, you need to change your language. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what do you mean? You need to change your language from this is bullshit to here's where it needs to go and then focus on that instead. It, it's, it's, it's just much more fulfilling to look at things from the standpoint of, okay, so it might be shit. Okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah. But what are we going to do about it? You know, yeah. come with solutions. You, you bring three, three really interesting pieces up there. Number one is other people can see us sometimes much better than we can see ourselves mm. in those aspects. So yep. having those people in our lives that are willing to call bullshit on us when we have that. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something, posting a tweet that is racist or homophobic or whatever it is that you don't want to do. Well, it's it's, it's more about like you being true to who you want to yeah. be as a person. 
Yeah. Secondly, you talk about language and language is this really interesting thing. Um, <laughs> uh, and, Much studies on these things. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> we, interviewed, we interviewed Gary Latham for um, uh, our podcast and uh, he talked about this, this experiment they did. And so they had a CEO of a company mm -hmm. and every, every Monday, the CEO sent out an email to everybody in the company. It's kind of a rah-rah email. Right. All really good. Right. And they said, hey, can we, it's about 150 uh, words long. Um, they said, hey, can we just take and replace 12 words? Ooh. And so, sure. So they did, Ooh. they replaced 12 words and they used achievement words like strive. And oh, cool. Keep going and, and nice. different pieces like that. And then, and, you know, they ran it by him and said, yep, that works. Um, they sent the, the one where they sent uh, the, the achievement words to half of the company. They sent the other to the other half. They track them on performance measures for a week. The people that got the words, the ones that had 12 achievement words in it, their, their performance increased by about 20 some percent and like other aspects of their work, um, uh, efficiency in various different pieces were like 40% improvement. 12 words in an email makes interesting. a huge difference. It's interesting. Words matter, right? Yeah. So to your point, this is bullshit or this is what we're going to do about it. Even just saying, you know what, this is what we're going to do about it. And we're going to strive together to get this done, you know, striving together. Those pieces change the dynamic of how people view that. That's, it's interesting. You, you remind me of a, of a story about uh, if you're a, uh, a manager, director, executive, especially when you're talking about like sales and stuff like that, there's a huge difference between coming to somebody that's and telling them, hey, your numbers aren't doing that good. You're going to have to do better or we're going to have to let you go versus your numbers are not that doing that great, man. I'm, I'm worried about you. Is everything okay? What's good? Yeah. What's not good? I mean, what can we do to support you here? Because I know you do better than this. Um, one of my buddies who was a stockbroker worked on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. He used to tell me, he says, if I blew two trades, I've hung the phone up, logged out, and I went golfing. And I'm like, probably the smartest thing you did in those days. And he's like, I ain't losing a third one. The hell with that. And I was like, and then what? And he goes, and the next day I'm back in and I'm making money again. I said, see, so you took the, the mental break that you needed and you didn't allow – the situation about the U.S. is when you when you talk about words. What what, what you know? What did your manager say? My manager told me get out of the office. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's perfect, right? Because yeah. you need that reset. You need that as your mind starts going in these elements where it goes and plays it over and over and over. And crazy it's a negative eight. downward spiral. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. And, and so, it to me, it's like the twelve words. It could be two words. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, saying, telling somebody just do better doesn't mean shit, Yeah, you know, but, but telling something, Hey, you matter. Yeah. Big difference. All of a well, sudden their, their head goes, well, wait a minute. If I matter, then I need to do better. And, and, and it starts a whole different chain of thinking, I would think. And it, and it might encourage like the 12 achievement words. You're encouraging yeah. people at that point to go, Hey, I know, I know you have this in you. I may be way up here in the ivory tower, but I know you're busting ass down there yeah. and I appreciate you. Let's keep going. Yeah. We, talk, we started to talk at the very beginning about the four drive model, and you just talked about, you know, this you matter part, right? So yes. the, the other two drives are about being challenged and learning. We're, we're inquisitive. We, we like challenges. So we, we're, we're motivated to do that. But the last one is this um, uh, define and defend. And you just talked about this element of matter. And this is the idea that we're motivated to defend those um, institutions. And like we used to be tribal, right? So we would yes. defend the tribe against yep. these things. Yep. And, and we're more likely to defend the tribe, um, that organization, when we feel that they are looking out for us, right? Yeah. They, they're concerned yeah. about us. Yeah. I need to be concerned about them. And so, as you said, saying, hey, you matter is huge because all of a sudden that that signals to uh the people that you're part we're we're in this together and yeah. I'm, con I'm i care about you as a person <clears throat> you're not just a, a cog a tool that makes this company money you are an individual and you're, you're a person and the more you can care um the the better you are there's i, I did some um research and some work with other some other behavioral scientists just talking mm -hmm. about this whole response to mm -hmm. covid and again how do you communicate out of that 
Yeah. And one of the things that uh, came crystal clear is companies that did well, mm -hmm. were companies that, that demonstrated how they cared, mm -hmm. how they cared about their employees, that they were focusing in on the employees and their customers versus companies that were just either matter of fact about here are the programs that we're putting in place or, or we're just like, nope, we're going full steam ahead um, no matter what. Yeah. Um, those companies are, mm. haven't fared as well. And the companies that showed, and, and this is literally months. I mean, yeah. this is quick. This is how yeah. fast this happens. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I, I know of a, like I live in Las Vegas and I actually have a connection to one of the casino chains out here. And one of the things that I, I did notice is their communication with their employees was strictly on their platform. Mm -hmm. They never once that I know of sent out a letter to anybody saying, hey, we know you guys are at home. We're trying to do our best for you. We're doing what yeah. we can. I never saw that. They're open. Everybody's busy. We all knew that was coming. I mean, yeah. the, the social distancing thing is social distancing. Where? What? what? Yeah. <laughs> they're all sit, they're all sitting at the tables in the machines and they're all playing. Um, but I think if you have if you have a an entity as a whole that looks at their whole and goes, yeah, without you, oh, we wouldn't we wouldn't even be able to reopen. You know, yeah. you'd probably get a lot more buy-in and loyalty. Um, I do it to my own group. I mean, I have a partnership of three. Mm -hmm. Out of the blue, I'll just write one and go, hey, just wanted to let you know I really appreciate you. You matter to me. Without you, we would not be doing what we're doing. But in case, in case I forget, I don't ever want you to think that I don't appreciate what you do. Yeah. And they always write back, yeah, I got you. It's all good. And I'm like, well, I just want you to know. There's – um. Part of the work we, as I talked about, we do a lot of work around incentives, um, mm -hmm. and and we do interviews with employees that get incentives all the time. One of the questions that we often ask is, "What's been the most meaningful, you know, incentive or recognition that you've ever received?" Right. And I am constantly amazed that it's not this big trip to Hawaii, it's not the five thousand dollar bonus I got, it's not all of this. It is I got a handwritten letter from my vice president or the president of the company. Um, that commented on a very, you know, on like, I, I saw what you did and I appreciate it. And that's, it's, it's, that's it's the key. cake. That's yeah. the cake. Everything else is icing. Yeah. The, but that's the cake. When a, when a VP takes the time to write a letter saying yeah. you did this, I saw that awesome job. Yeah, exactly. And they have them. They put them up on their walls. They, they, you know, this is something they, they talk about that. And I'm going, so it's better than the trip to Rome? Hell yes. You know, I mean, it, it, it's more meaningful to me. Yeah. And, and again, you talked, we talked at the beginning, right? It's like some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by other things. And for a, a vast majority of people, those types of, you took the time and the effort to notice me and to then take that effort to really go ahead and make a, a statement to say, yes, I did notice you and thank you for that. Those are so, big. Those so are let's go back to that question um, with regards to creating, because I have entrepreneurs and executives that listen to this. When you're talking about creating an incentive program that means something mm -hmm. to your employees, whether that's sales operations, market, doesn't matter, what kind of elements need to be considered? Yeah. So with that, so we talk about obviously – there's a monetary thing. And so uh, you, you need to, you know, particularly if people are depending upon the money, mm -hmm. depending on how mm -hmm. much you pay them, mm -hmm. all of those, those are key. Right, 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 right. So take that, that's, that's, that's table stakes, right? Yeah. There yep. you go. That's yep. what you, you, you got to get that. You got to get that right. Yep. But then over and above that, it's, it's like, think about those things, those little add-ons that really mean a lot, whether it be a short-term, you can do a short-term contest that people that maybe as a team, so as a team, let's have a team goal. And then as a team, if we win this, we get to do something fun together. So it's that bonding part. There's a yep. challenge aspect about it. There's that bonding part. It could be, you know, you're in Vegas and, you know, if you are okay socially distancing at a casino, it could be going out to a casino and doing something like that. It could be going Not to happening. a ball game. It could be, <laughs> yeah. you know, yep. what, whatever that would be. Back in, it's a lot easier pre-COVID days. On yeah, right, exactly. Aspects. But, you know, it's get something where people are having that ability to bond and have fun with each other and maybe bring in, you know, significant others, because that's another great yeah. way of building yeah. those bonding and, and belonging aspects. Um, 
those personal recognition pieces that we talked that you just talked those writing those notes. I I often tell people, look, if you're a manager, um, you need to set aside time every week just to take 15 minutes. It depends on how many people you have. Yeah. But to think back over the week about what your employees did and and just make note of that. And yep. whether that then is like you write a handwritten note to him, a card, or whether it's on the next team meeting that you say, hey, I just want to, you know, call out Sally because Sally did this. You know, those are meaningful moments for people. Yep. Um, you know, little, little things, those on the spot recognition pieces, like in you're in the moment, which is, again, one of the biggest things to reinforce behavior mm-hmm. is recognizing positive behavior when it's as close to when it happens as possible. Don't oh, yeah. wait till that annual review. Don't wait to other things. Um, but yeah, put in those short little month long contests for the team, put in some goals for the organization overall. And you, we all win if we all do better, right. uh, do some of those types of things. Uh, and then try to play into some of the, the intrinsic pieces of, you know, that handwritten note, you know, recognizing people on their birthdays, having fun, are all real key pieces of all that. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that'll, hopefully that'll change a few things for some people because I do know of some incentive programs that are still stuck in the 70s. Yeah, there's a lot of those yet. Yeah, (laughs) you know. You know, if you pay more, it doesn't necessarily change behavior that much, particularly after a certain point. No, Um, it, it actually, I think it actually reinforces the negativities of competition. Competition is healthy, but it can become unhealthy at a point when you start you know, getting people divergent to relationships yeah. in internally. Um, and and well, that's and why we, we try to push the presence, you know, being present with your own people, even if there's an incentive program going on. Yeah. Don't miss that that other person that, that just didn't win is probably beating on themselves for not making it. You need, you still need to be there for them too. I mean, and, they're your and colleague. They could have been, and they could have been really close. I mean, that's yeah. the thing is they like you make super close. because you have to, right? And that's part of how it goes. And, and the thing about sometimes with, uh, you know, if you start paying people, you, you know, then what we have, we have this attribution error. So we attribute why we're doing something because I'm only reason I'm doing it is because they get, they offered this incentive, right? Right. And, right. and if you do some of these other things, you're doing it because I care for the company. I care about my customers. I care about what we're doing and the, the difference that we're making in the world those get reinforced through those other intrinsic types of things. And that's the type of motivation that you want from an, from your employees that you want, you know, from your kids, you know, all of those types of things. So it applies to a number of things beyond that. So, so internally as an entrepreneur, because we are the ones that are some of the hardest on ourselves, how do you, how do you improve healthy habits? And, 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 I, and I say healthy, I'm talking about overall, not just your physical health. How do you improve healthy habits to keep yourself from running down the wonderful thought attack road that our brains love to run down? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> rumination, right? We, we ruminate over these yeah, negative exactly. things. We go back and forth. Um, so uh, uh, Victor Frankel, I think, uh, and don't quote me on that, uh, had this great quote. He said, between stimulus uh, and response, there's a moment. Um, and, and that moment is where we make our uh, you know, that makes all the decisions and we determine how we, we, we approach something. Uh, and so this ability to take a pause, this ability to uh, stop uh, that negative downward spiral. And mm-hmm. oftentimes, uh, you know, you can, whatever you think about meditation or mindfulness, mm-hmm. those are ways of, of teaching Pausing. our brain yeah. how, to, how to stop in the moment yeah. and to see this thought and recognize this thought and then say, okay, that's a thought. Now I move on from that right. thought. Right. And, and being able to, to do some of that practice, um, you, you know, the sense of, uh, uh, we talked with a, a sports uh, psychologist who uh, actually he's a, the, does all this work with high-performing athletes and different things. And he's talking mm-hmm. about these people are on this stage. It's this big stage. And, you know, this idea that people don't get nervous on those big stages just because they're a professional athlete is bullshit. Yeah. Um, they do. They've just created ways to pause and to get calm and to, to reassess themselves in, in those moments. So those are, again, and he said that's through practice. That's through this intentional ways of meditating, thinking through, envisioning yourself in those moments uh, and taking that time. So, 
it's interesting that you mentioned sports figures because there's a lot of big boys like during the NFL draft. Yep. You ever notice how nervous they are? Yeah. Do you ever notice how nervous they get when they get up on stage? They're up there, they're smiling. And the only reason they're smiling is because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> they're sitting there, they're going, I can't believe this. My dream is coming true. And here's so-and-so shaking my hand and I'm on this team now. And it doesn't really set in per se, not at that moment. And they're just, they're, they're, they're giddy and they're nervous as hell. And most people think, oh, he's got to be excited. Well, yeah, but not quite the way you think. Yeah. Some of the biggest men that I know that have some of the biggest hearts have a hard time being on stage in front of people talking. Yeah. Then you got me five foot seven and I'm on stage and I'm a loud mouth. <laughs> you know, I have no problem talking to a crowd and, and I'll, I'll do whatever I can to get them to laugh too. And it's, it's, you know, I think, wow, we did it. Um, I think I want to, I want to bring this to a summation here. Um, where as humankind going through the different elements that we've gone through, how can we as a, as a group of humans, let's get out of the corporate world, the entrepreneur, how can we as a group of humans support each other to being healthy minded so that, you know, I mean, we're talking about behavioral science here. How yeah. can we support each other to be healthy minded in the midst of all the crazy shit that's going on right now, you know, again, I don't get political or, or deal with any of the, but we've got serious crises on our hands. Yeah. How do we support each other? So I think the big piece is, and this is the piece that behavioral science points to, is that we are, as humans, we are emotional creatures. Oh, over and, in some cases. Yeah, and I'm not saying necessarily emotional in that we we cry or different things, but no, 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 responses no, no. are yep. are we have uh, Daniel Kahneman talks about system one thinking versus system two. System one is that initial gut feel kind of thing you make pretty instantaneous, and then system two is our rational cognitive where we think about yep. things. Yep. And and they work in conjunction. They're they're not they're not necessarily separate, but they work in conjunction. But this idea that we're human and that we're emotional creatures and just understanding that is that gives us a little bit of grace. Because yeah. it says, I understand, you know, Michael, you might have said something in the spur of the moment and I feel, ah, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. but I got to go, wait, you know, he, he probably didn't intend it to be that way. And I responded because of my gut re reaction and maybe it was cloudy in Minneapolis and it was sunshiny or vice versa, right? Yeah, it's sunshiny exactly. here and it's cloudy in, in Las Vegas, <laughs> exactly. whatever it would actually probably the other, you know, it's <laughs> probably sunny there, <laughs> cloudy here. Uh, but those are those times. It's just so taking that moment to just say we're all human and we all have our human frailties and our biases and various different pieces and to work with that person and understand that. And if we can do that, it just a little bit and not expect everybody to always be perfect and that we are irrational in the way that we operate. Those are, if we can do that, I think, will be it won't solve every problem i mean there's a big systematic problems that we have mm -hmm. but it'll go a long way in helping us at least get to the point where we can start solving some of those questions i i believe that wholeheartedly and with the fact that humans on both sides need to remember that i think a lot of better conversations can begin um in any in any realm or platform um i i think a lot of times when people just fly off the cuff on stuff they have a tendency to speak their mind but speak their mind with those biases instead of stopping and thinking well what would happen if i actually said this and what was the real intent behind you know, just just exactly what you went through yeah. so cool thank you for that advice um guys that's it we're 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 at the end i i, I had a bunch more questions but i i 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We can, we, we can uh, do another one if, if that please, was. Uh, please, please. I, 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 yeah. think, I, I think this was, um, one, it was very insightful. I learned a ton. Thank you for, you actually helped me connect a few dots about my own thinking um, and, and not so much confirmation bias, but you confirmed quite a few things for me that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing that are, that are in, the right, in the right frame. So that's, that's really awesome. Thank you so much uh, for hanging out with me on Java Chat, having a cup of Joe and chatting some serious uh some serious subjects and making it fun All right. um guys this is this is java chat sitting here with kurt talk oh where can people find you um 
Yeah, so you can obviously go out to the website, lanterngroup.com. We have contact in there. Behavioral Grooves is on, uh, again, whatever pod service that you listen to. Go to the website, for, Behavioral Grooves. Just search website. for it. It's on Google. I found it that way. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I'm on Twitter at, at what motivates. So uh, uh, I'll be following that right after this. I guarantee. Right. There you go. Um, are you on LinkedIn too, by chance? Yes, LinkedIn, Kurt W. Nelson. So, okay, cool, uh, cool, yeah. cool. I'm going to put all those links up, guys, for you in the description, of course, both on YouTube and on Anchor. I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, please make sure that you subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, and if you're on anchor.fm or any of the other platforms that this shows up on like Spotify or iPods, iPodcasts, et cetera, thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. Make sure you share this one in particular because this is some real good stuff, guys, uh, with your friends, with your colleagues. Um, and remember, stay up, stay healthy, stay safe, but live. Love all of you. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk with you soon. Ciao for now. And that's it, my friend.